that shit. Welcome to Trash Talk MMA. Smile on my face, behind my back, I talk trash. The number one podcast for news and insight that matters in the world of mixed martial arts. I don't want to hear it. Brought to you live and unfiltered. Fucking punk. From all four corners of the globe. That's what you said. By MMA aficionado Antoine Pelchay. Yo, and welcome to the Trash Talk MMA Podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Pelche. Today, we're going to be picking up where we left off at the end of episode 17, part three of my interview with managing director of Tiger Muay Thai, Will Elliott. So another fascinating program that you guys have for emerging fighters or people who want to come here and possibly become a professional fighter under the tutelage of the Tiger Muay Thai camp are your fighter tryouts. Explain those a little bit for us, Will. After we rebranded the MMA program and uh, put a world-class instructor team in place comprised of Roger Huerta, a uh, fifth-degree black belt, Fernando Macacharo, and Brian Ebersol a few years ago, we're sitting around and brainstorming and said, all right, let's get the best Muay Thai and MMA fight team that we've ever had in the history of Tiger. Then let's have them stay here and be good training partners for guests, which will in turn attract more high-level fighters. And it worked in spades. All right, so we, we held the first one. We opened up uh, applications, like anyone could submit an application, but it was an invite-only kind of affair. Okay. I think we had a little under 200 applicants, and we only chose people that we really thought stood a chance of actually winning a scholarship. What the scholarship would entail is uh, a f- a food and protein covered at our restaurant, uh, accommodation assistance, uh, free training, access to the world-class trainers. They would really be taken under the wing of the coaches, right? And media support, meaning we make profiles about the guys, we put out videos about their progress, publicize who they are and what they're up to. So that works so well uh, the first year that we're immediately copied by four other uh, camps, <laughs> wow. which I, I find flattering. Oh, it's the sincerest, form, sincerest form of flattery is imitation. Right. So that's something... Were these local camps or like other worldwide uh, some, camps? Somewhere local, somewhere international. Okay. But uh, the point is, it was a good idea. It's Trash Talk MMA, dude. You can name names yeah. if you want. Oh, <laughs> it, it was great fun as well. It was, I mean, it was a whole lot of fun. And it actually... A byproduct of doing really cool things is you get marketing. That wasn't the end goal, but... Yeah, we filmed it. We filmed it and we put it on YouTube. We we're just kind of mucking around. Oh, so it's almost like your own like Ultimate yeah. Fighter, or not Ultimate yeah. Fighter, because yeah. Y- y- it's yeah, but basically guys coming in and competing to be sponsored and fight under the right, Tiger right. Time brawl. So it's interesting content. Uh, the point is to, to get the best uh, Muay Thai and MMA fight team that we've ever had, which we we definitely accomplished, and. We filmed it, put it on YouTube the first season, just because it, it was something cool that was happening at the camp. Yeah. So, and they were very, very popular online. And this year, uh, or the year that just passed, uh, Fox Sports even came out to cover it. Very cool. But after one of our videos went viral online, receiving uh, over 35,000 shares and millions of views on Facebook. That was the, the Muay Thai episode. <laughs> okay. Right? Out of out of these tryouts, how many people get a sponsorship? How many people make the cut? Seven. And there was well, about that's two hundred applicants. Yes. Okay. That's because we had about uh, we had some guys already that we we wanted to keep, so we had seven spots available. Okay. We have more than that on our sponsored team, but some of the guys we just we already had at that point. Uh, we had seven slots available because we have a, a budget. Right. So, what are the plans for the, these tryouts in 2015? Okay. Collectively, as a group, the coaches and myself decided not to have them because we like our guys so much, we want to keep them, and there's so much potential. Guys like Bruno Robusto with 7-1 and one, uh, pro MMA record and 30 Muay Thai fights. Guys like Alex Volkanovsky, who's 9-1. and one. Uh, People like Valentino Shevenko, who's got more Muay Thai and kickboxing <laughs> fights and can be recorded and is 12-1 and one in MMA. I mean, right. We've got guys like Arby that are about to be signed to the UFC, likely. What's Arby's last name? 
It's very hard to pronounce, but I can write it for you. Okay. Yeah, or, I, want, I, want, I want to get these guys uh, okay. so I can correctly uh, articulate the spelling of their names on, okay. uh, on my blog post. Obviously, we want to keep Zoo. We want to keep Maribek. We want to keep Tariq Solomon. Uh, so, yeah, you guys George have basically Pittman. put together a lot of people, and you want to you want to right. develop these guys now. Right. We think that there are, they're on the brink. Of, some of them are signed to big organizations, and some of them are on the verge of getting signed to even bigger organizations. So, yeah, I know a lot of people were disappointed that we weren't going to do the trials this year, but we can't bear. Uh, we got to hold on to these guys. We still have some gotta guys. Cultivate. Here. Yes. Got to cultivate. cultivate them more. Yep. So we're just kind of adjusting as we, we go along. We thought it would be an annual program. Uh, we still have some guys here from the first year. Kai Franz is still here. <laughs> right, we can't bear to let him go, right? Yeah. He will be doing some cool stuff. Now, is George also a trainer here? Uh, he is now. Yes, he's uh, an assistant trainer. He helps out Roger in the wrestling okay. because he's a Division One wrestler. Oh, wait. Fantastic. Right. Okay. So he assists Roger with uh, the wrestling coaching. Yeah, I'm going to want so, to talk to George, too. It seems like an interesting right. cat. I met him at the uh, when we all watched UFC 184 the other day. Yeah. So George is a guy. Oh, uh, yeah. He is an interesting story, actually. Now, we don't show favoritism at all in the, the fighter trials, but we definitely, we were aware of him because uh, Brian Stan put his name forth. Wow. Brian Stan, a very solid individual. Absolutely. Uh, former uh, former middleweight contender, Brian yep. Stan. And UFC commentator. Put forth uh, George Hickman's profile to myself and the coaches. And then Alan Belcher did. Okay, so he's co-signed by some big guns. Yeah. And, and then our, our friend Musin Corbra, he frequents the camp, usually comes out at least uh, once a year. Okay. So we had a big heads up about this guy, but said, okay, well, he can come participate. He's not going to get a buy, you know, a free pass by any stretch of the imagination. But Yeah, it seems like everybody has to show and prove. Yeah, he really shined in, in the tryouts. Okay. Uh, we made these guys, they ran the Buddha in the morning after a grueling three-day tryout and then participate in a grappling tournament against people from other camps that had been resting. And they'd gone through a really... Yeah, and he won his division, as did Alex Volkanovski, as did Oleg. Yeah, so the guys are brutes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're absolute beasts. And he's got Muay Thai to boot from a... He was a pretty good Muay Thai striker before he came out here. And now he's just honed it even further, so... Well, it's interesting to hear, you know, about the, the tryouts, and I can imagine that, yeah, like the people have gotten in there. I'm sure there's other people who would like to be involved with these trials, and I'm sure eventually you'll bring it back. But, uh, you know, to, to grow quicker than uh, than the success of the guys, I think that'd be a mistake. And it sounds like you're making the smart thing of, hey, we've identified the talent. They fit into the philosophy of the camp. They're kicking ass. They're, they're taking names. And uh, to, to, to grow these guys is probably going to do wonders, again, right. for the international growth of Tiger Muay Thai. Right. And then having such guys on our roster attracts really high-level training partners yeah. as well. I mean, we got guys coming through all the time that are preparing for UFC fights that came here of their own accord. Yep. Right. Uh, preparing for 1FC fights, preparing for UFC, preparing for fight nights in Russia, preparing for Desert Force. Uh, preparing for fights in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, it all just uh, works side and side to boost the credibility of everybody involved. You know, right. it's crazy win-win-win situations. Right. So good business is good business. We help people. Yeah, right. and what goes around comes around. And it seems like uh, you guys have obviously done some really good things because there's a lot of good coming around. Another initiative uh, that we've spoken about in our discussions has been your basically your trainer deployment program where if fighters abroad don't have the bandwidth or the availability to come train here, you guys will actually send some of your top-notch trainers to those countries right. and those respective camps. Let's speak a bit about that. We like to give our trainers opportunities to travel abroad. Some of the younger trainers that are eager to explore the world that show uh, good work ethic have a lot of opportunity to, to travel. And we have our, our friendly, like uh, loose affiliates, right? Okay. So we loan our trainers out. Yeah, we've got trainers in China. We, we sent two trainers to Beijing. We've got a trainer in Qatar. He, he went to Dubai. Uh, we pretty much consistently keep a trainer in Kuala Lumpur, uh, sometimes two trainers. We have one in Borneo, at Borneo Travel Squad. That's our friend uh, AJ Pyro and and Athena Osman, you know, 1FC contractor, or 
won championship contracted fighters. We keep a coach out in Bali as well, with the Leon brothers. We have trainers going abroad pretty frequently. They get to bring the authentic Muay Thai training to those mixed martial arts schools. Oh, yeah, and, and, and then, Jakarta as well. We had a, a trainer in Jakarta multiple times recently. Okay. And it seems like, again, they just serve as evangelists and ambassadors for, for everything that's going on with Tiger Muay Thai. Yeah, I think it's a great chance for those that would like to travel as well. So, uh, not every trainer yeah. can be bothered. <laughs> well, I mean, what's interesting with that is that reflects back on your own personal and professional, uh, you know, your background. That, uh, you, you know, you took, the, you took the initiative to travel and you took the initiative to stop what you were doing back home in the States and relocate your existence to here. You took some risks, you brought into your horizons, and it's great to see that uh, that's actually become part of the lifeblood of the camp itself. Camp culture. Yes, exactly. Now, we have a young man, um, Crew Bird. He's an orphan. He's 20 years old, just got his passport. And he's wow. an excellent, excellent trainer. He has no parents. He's 300 fights. You know where he is right now? He's in Dubai, making awesome. pretty good money. And before that, he flew business class to Qatar. <laughs> and he's training uh, the Sheikh, or one of the Sheikhs out there, Sheikh Nasser. Unbelievable. Right. So this so, is a, a Thai national yeah. who just got his passport for the first time right. after, at the age of at the age of 20? Yeah, it was difficult because he's an orphan. Wow. Right. And now he's in Dubai. Right now. Training shakes there. Yes. <laughs> and he's making some good money. Fantastic. And for a young man like that, he shows uh, a lot of dedication at work, right? So when he comes back, he, he'll have a lot more chances to travel. And we have a multitude of other trainers like that. Incredible. Great. Right. I mean, Incredible. No, I mean, it sounds like there's just such a... Uh, like I said, I announced you as a, as a thought leader and, uh, you know, we've only had some brief discussions up until now and, and just being exposed to all of this insight that you've been able to provide, it sounds like you guys are really trailblazing a number of incredibly, you know, motivating and powerful initiatives from Tiger Muay Thai across Southeast Asia and the rest of the world. Thank you. Camp culture, it's, uh, the camp is a reflection on the people that work there. So yeah. we tried to staff it with down-to-earth, humble uh, people people. And of course, incredibly talented and, and high credentials. Right, and these are qualities that we look for not only in the staff members, but also in the fight team members. Yeah, Being a, a talented fighter isn't enough. If you're an yeah. egotistical guy that's hard to deal with uh, and unprofessional, you're not gonna be welcome here. Yeah, you need to fit into the mold of, of the, and, and the brand of the company. Moreover, it permeates the camp itself because the entire camp is staffed that way. People like Roger Huerta, people like Fernando Macachero, they're, they're down to earth, they're approachable, they're, they're humble. Yeah. Right? And yeah, I mean, all I've the just noticed coaches, that from, right. from everyone that I've interacted with here. It just yeah. feels like, it, we have like a, how are they all cut from the same mold? Because yeah. it's the camp culture that was purpose built by yeah. me. Yeah. These are, these are philosophies that you apply at the hiring level. Oh, yeah. You know, so, so if you don't fit, it, it, there's just no chance if you, if you just don't fit right. that mold to work here. When people walk into the camp, they can feel that it's a welcoming uh, culture. It takes a lot of guts for an overweight person to come here to what's perceived to be a fight camp. <laughs> for sure, dude. On a, so we're all about bettering ourselves and getting out of your comfort zone because we live it from the top down, right? Yep. So that's why the single middle-aged overweight woman has the courage, which yep. was probably hard to find, to come over here amongst all the people with eight packs, right, and yep. and reach a life goal, right? We, we don't allow for racism, and we don't allow for uh, being derogatory towards different body types as well. It's all checked at the door. Yep. It has to be, otherwise they'll be kicked out. So it's really nice to see there's no ethnic boundaries here, and people aren't berated for wherever they're at in life because they're proactively trying to do something about it. Whether their goal is to fight in 1FC or get in the best shape of their life or quit smoking and turn over a new leaf. Everyone's welcome here. Speaking on that note and coming off of a, ve a very uh, female dominant UFC 184 event, I mean we have to speak about the presence of, uh, of women in this facility too. and. How you know? How how has that evolved? You, you walk through the facility, and there's an incredible amount of, of females and women hitting the heavy bags, hitting the pads. I, I mean, speak to that. There's been an incredible okay. growth. 
Well, that also was done on purpose, right? First, we had to make it safe and welcoming for women. If uh, one woman walked through here and 200 guys eyed her like a piece of meat, she wouldn't feel safe, right? Yeah. Uh, we made it female friendly and safe, right? So s s solo female travelers can come over here and feel safe. Uh, they're treated with professional customer service and guided. Yeah, we made the environment safe and female friendly, and that in turn attracts more males. <laughs> <laughs> Funny how that works. Yeah. No, but I mean, it's it's awesome to see that. Uh, you know, I remember when I came out here for the first time, and a, a lot of people that I know and some of my female friends were like, "Hey, you know, I'd be interested in doing something like that. Is it is it cool for for chicks to come out here and do this?" And I'm like, "Listen, I, I'll let you know." And then I got out here. I'm like, "I'm like, oh, totally. Just just come on out." First right. of all. I think even just as a, I mean, anybody can come to Phuket and feel really safe in general as a tourist here. But another thing to understand is on this strip, there's nobody messing with anybody because you're dealing with a whole bunch of, you know, of professionally trained fighters out here. Everybody in some capacity knows how to throw a punch and a kick or an elbow. And I haven't seen any instance of crime or violence uh, yeah. on the road here because you just, you don't mess with anybody because you don't really know yeah. what anybody's capable of and there's a huge amount of respect between everybody who comes to visit here. They come from all over the world, men, women, tourists, amateurs, professionals. It's just a huge, huge compound full of, uh, of people that are, are here to support one another. Right. Uh, that leads into another interesting topic, which is this road. I'd like to talk a little bit about this road. Please. This is a two kilometer facility. Uh, sorry, a two kilometer road. Uh, five years ago, it consisted of rubber trees. Both sides, pure rubber plantation, very sleepy street and a sleepy town, right? Not much going on. Now there's seven training facilities. Seven. Yep. There's 30 hotels. There's 30 restaurants. There's five pharmacies. There's massage places. There's souvenir shops. There's two latex factories. There's two family marts. Yeah. The land Open price skyrocketed. There is building in every available square meter. This two-kilometer road is an international hotbed destination for martial arts, healthy living. Yeah, fitness training. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, if if any of you know anybody listening to this show has ever considered mixing up you know their holiday time with getting in shape, getting healthy learning some self-defense, learning some martial arts, even if you're just a fan of the UFC or, or, or one championship or any major type of martial art, expose yourself to it. Come check it out. It'll, it'll change your life. You know, it definitely changed mine. Well, listen, Will, we've covered a plethora of really, really interesting topics. It's been uh, an inspiring and educational experience for me. Uh, I can definitely relate to the path that you've taken. I worked in the video game industry as an audio director for 15 years, got completely burnt out, was, as I like to put it, comfortably miserable. I quit my job, I sold all my shit, I took a one-way ticket to uh, the Dominican Republic and I've been traveling the world for a year and a half, about 25 countries. It really opens the mind, the body and the soul uh, so I can relate to your path. I think it's fascinating and inspiring that you you found your calling coming out of that. and. Uh, I'm, you know, launching my new business right now, uh, TrashTalkMMA.com and my podcast, and I'm blessed to, um, you know, to have had the doors at Tiger Muay Thai open to me to interview all the fascinating guests and professionals working here. I really want to thank you for coming in, sharing your knowledge, sharing your insight, and listen, buddy, I hope this is just one in the streak of many. You're always welcome to promote you, your camp, and all the great fighters at Tiger Muay Thai. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed getting to talk about this subject because it's near and dear to my heart, man. Excellent. Uh, okay. Like I said, you're welcome anytime. I hope this is, a, is the first in the series of many. Uh, life is meant to be an adventure. Excellent. This was the Trash Talk MMA podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Pelche, with my guest, Managing Director Will Elliott from Tiger Muay Thai. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Trash Talk MMA podcast. Be sure to visit TrashTalkMMA.com. And don't forget to follow Antoine on Twitter at Trash Talk MMA. Let us know you're listening. Use hashtag Trash Talk MMA.